Hey there folks, Zach here. One of our main topics this week was the multivariable chain rule. To remind you of how the chain rule works, let's take a look at the following example. Here we have a roller coaster moving along a track. Now as time passes, the coaster's x and y coordinates change, right? Maybe at time t equals 0, the coaster is above this point in the xy plane. Maybe at time t equals 1, the coaster is above this point in the xy plane, and so on. In this example, the coaster's xy coordinates are cos t sine t at time t. But note that the coaster also has a z component, a height. We're told that when the coaster is directly above the point xy, its height is given by z equals x squared y plus x plus 1. We'd like to know the rate at which the coaster's height is changing at a general time t. How quickly is it climbing or falling? Now at first, this may look a little weird. We're asking for the rate of change, or the derivative, of z with respect to time. But it looks like z is only a function of x and y, not t. There are no t's here. Well, it's true that z depends on x and y. But since these variables change with time, so too does z. In other words, if you know time, you also know x and y. But if you know x and y, you also know z. So we can instead think of z as a function of t. Maybe its graph looks something like this. The height of the coaster changes over time. But how can we calculate the rate of change, the derivative of z with respect to t, if z is currently expressed in terms of just x and y? Well, it turns out there are a couple ways we could approach this problem. Let's check them out on the next slide. One option for finding this derivative would be to first substitute the expressions for x and y in terms of t into our height function. Since at time t, x is cos t and y is sine t, we can write z as a function of t explicitly like this. From here, we can use our usual derivative rules to calculate the rate of change. This might not be the sleekest approach, but it certainly works. The downside in this example is that we end up with a product of functions of t, and so we're kind of forced to apply the product rule. It turns out, though, that there's another method that's usually a little slicker and often avoids lengthy derivative calculations. Instead of using substitution, we can apply the multivariable chain rule. You see, right now we have z as a function of x and y, and x and y as functions of t. We can represent these relationships using a dependence tree. Z's at the top, x and y are intermediate variables at level 2, and t, the independent variable, is at the bottom. This week, you learned that in order to calculate the derivative of z with respect to t, we can do so by following the branches of this diagram. Specifically, we're going to move down the branches, taking derivatives as we go. We multiply the derivatives down a particular branch and add the results from separate branches. So in this case, we can start by following the left branch. The first step tells us to take a partial derivative of z with respect to x. It's a partial derivative since there are multiple variables at level 2. And then we multiply by the derivative of x with respect to t. It's not a partial derivative this time because we only have one variable at this level. We'll do the same along the other branch. Partial z by partial y times dy by dt. And we'll add the results. And there you have it, folks. The chain rule tells us that the derivative we're looking for is really this combination of derivatives that we can calculate using the information from the problem. In particular, using this expression for z, we find that partial z by partial x is 2xy plus 1, whereas partial z by partial y is x squared. Using these expressions for x and y in terms of t, we find that dx by dt is minus sine t, and dy by dt is cos t. Now at this point, our derivative is expressed in terms of x's, y's, and t's. If you want an answer that just involves t, like we had above, well, you can replace x and y with these functions. You should get something like this, and I'll let you verify as an exercise that when you expand everything out, you really do have the same thing as in method 1. Pretty cool, huh? The chain rule is nice and fairly easy to use, and it actually saved us from applying the product rule as we did in method 1. Thanks, chain rule. Now this is really the simplest form of the multivariable chain rule, but it turns out this result extends to much more general settings. Let's check out some more examples. Here I have three examples that highlight other situations in which the chain rule can be used. 
I encourage you at this point to pause the video and see if you can compute these three derivatives using what you learned in week five. Okay, in our first case, we have a function of three intermediate variables, w, x, and y, that each depend on a single independent variable, t. Now folks, whether there's two variables, three variables, or 300 variables at level two, we still follow the same approach. Multiply derivatives down the branches and add the results. So in this case, if we're looking for the derivative of z with respect to t, our leftmost branch gives us partial z by partial w times dw by dt. We add the result from the middle branch, partial z by partial x times dx by dt. And finally, the result from the last branch, partial z by partial y dy by dt. It's very, very similar to what we had on the last slide. We just have one more branch to consider. In our second example, it looks like we have two independent variables. We have s and t down at the bottom. So in this case, we're actually looking for a partial derivative, the partial derivative of z with respect to s. Well, the process is almost identical, except now we're only gonna follow the branches that lead us from z to s. We don't really care about what's happening with t. So following this leftmost branch, we get partial z by partial x, times partial x by partial s. This time it is a partial derivative because x depends on two variables. Now we have to follow the right branch. We get partial z by partial y times partial y by partial s. Finally, you can end up in some pretty crazy situations with lots of wacky dependencies, but as long as you follow the diagram, everything will work out fine. In this case, we're looking for the partial derivative of z with respect to the independent variable v. So we're gonna follow all paths from z to v. I see we have a path on the left. That gives us partial z by partial x times partial x by partial s times partial s by partial v. We also have a path going down the middle of our tree. That gives us partial z by partial x times partial x by partial t, but now t only depends on v. So our last derivative is dt by dv. Finally, there's a path on the right. That gives partial z by partial y times dy by ds, right? y only depends on s here, times partial s by partial v. Okay, it took us a moment, but the chain rule led us to the right answer. Finally, it's important to think about the assumptions that are being made when we use one of our theorems. In this case, the multivariable chain rule only applies to differentiable functions. So we're assuming that at every stage of our tree diagram, the variables are related through a differentiable function. Z is a differentiable function of X and Y, X and Y are differentiable functions of S and T, and so on. Okay, let's wrap up this video with one more example. Now, lots of students have been asking about finding second derivatives using the chain rule. So I'd like to cover an example where we do exactly this. Here we have a variable z that's a function of x and y, and we're assuming that that function is c2, meaning it has second partial derivatives and those derivatives are continuous. Now x and y themselves are functions of two other variables, r and s. In this question, we're looking for the first and second partial derivatives of z with respect to the independent variable r. At this point, it would be a great time to pause the video and see how far you can make it through this example. Okay, let's start with the first partial derivative. We have the following tree of dependencies. Z's at the top, X and Y are at level two, and X and Y each depend on R and S. So these variables occur at the bottom. We're looking for a partial derivative of Z with respect to R. So we'll follow the paths from Z to R, giving us partial z by partial r equals partial z by partial x times partial x by partial r plus partial z by partial y, partial y by partial r. Now, without further information about our function, we won't be able to compute these partial derivatives of z with respect to x and y. But we can compute these partial derivatives of x and y with respect to r. From this equation, we find that partial x by partial r is 2r, and from this equation, we find that partial y by partial r is 2s, giving us a derivative of 2r partial z by partial x plus 2s partial z by partial y. Now at this stage, we need to move on to our second partial derivative. 
But before we do so, I'm actually going to rewrite this expression. I'm going to rewrite it as 2r times fx plus 2s times fy. You might not like that I'm mixing notation for partial derivatives, but I think this notation is helpful for remembering that these guys are themselves functions, right? f was a function of x and y, and so its derivatives are also functions of x and y. And x and y are functions of r and s. This is going to be important when we do our second derivative. To find the second partial derivative of z with respect to r, we're going to differentiate our first partial derivative. Partial squared z by partial r squared is the partial with respect to r of 2r fx plus 2s fy. Ah, now you can see why it's important to remember that these guys are functions of x and y, and hence functions of r and s. We're going to have to differentiate what's in the brackets here. And when we move our derivative inside, this is actually going to give us a product rule, right? fx depends on r and s at the end of the day. So let's write this down. When we bring the derivative inside, the product rule on this first term gives us the partial of 2r with respect to r times fx plus 2r times the partial of fx with respect to r. When the derivative moves over to this second term, well, it's going to pass right through this 2s. S doesn't depend on R. It's its own independent variable. So it passes through the 2S, and then we differentiate Fy with respect to R. Let's continue our calculations on the next slide. Okay, here's where we left off. Now it's easy enough to find the partial derivative of 2R with respect to R. It's just 2. But how do we calculate the partials of Fx and Fy with respect to R? Well, I'm going to reiterate it one more time, folks fx and fy are functions of x and y, and hence functions of r and s. They have their own tree diagrams. For fx, we have our function at the top, x and y at level 2, and r and s at the bottom. And we get the same sort of diagram for fy. So if you want to calculate the partial derivative of fx with respect to r, you're going to have to follow the tree diagram just like we did at the start of the problem. With this in mind, our derivative becomes 2 times fx plus 2r, and now I'm going to follow these paths in yellow. I get partial fx with respect to x times partial x by partial r, plus partial fx with respect to y times partial y by partial r. The term on the outside becomes 2s, and now I'm going to follow my paths in green. Partial fy by partial x times partial x by partial r, plus partial fy by partial y, times partial y by partial r. Here I've just used the chain rule two more times. At this point, we can clean things up. The partial of fx with respect to x, that's the second partial derivative with respect to x. This is fxx. Likewise, this term here is going to be fxy. This term here is going to be fyx. And here we have fyy. We can also compute these partial derivatives of x and y with respect to r. In fact, we did that on the last slide. Partial x by partial r was 2r, so these are both 2r, and partial y by partial r was 2s. All right, folks, it's been a long calculation, and I've probably said the word partial about uncountably many times, but we're effectively at the end. I'm just going to expand what's in the brackets and we'll simplify what we have. I got 2fx plus 4r squared fxx plus 4rs fxy plus 4rs fyx plus 4s squared fyy. And there's not really much more we can do to simplify this because we don't know anything about f. However, we can notice that fxy and fyx are the same. After all, our function is in C2. Its second partial derivatives exist and are continuous. So by Clairaut's theorem, the mixed partial derivatives are really the same. We can therefore simplify our answer to get something like this. And there you go, folks. That's the end.